Okay, I was asked to talk about the retirement challenge, um, which I think is really weird when you look at the age range in the room. But really, what my presentation is about is about adapting to change, really. And the challenge of retirement, I think, is as much about adapting to change. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about is probably looking backwards as much as looking forward. And, and really, it's like, how did I get here? You know, how did I get to this position where um, you get somebody saying, actually, you should tuck your shirt in? Because that's the most important thing. My shirt's tucked in, as you can see. Um, but I suppose for me, in terms of going forward, the big retirement challenge is whether this decision results in me having a smiley face, or in 12 months' time, if they ask me to come back and go, it's probably one of the worst decisions I've ever made. But before I go through that, I thought it's important really just to talk about we have Vale just for a few seconds so you see what type of organisation we are because I think that gives a good context to the challenges that we've had in the past. Uh, we're a housing association, uh, a number of in the room who are housing associations as well. We've got just over 6,000 homes, uh, 300 staff. And the thing that I always like to remind people or point out if they don't know is we're based in Cheshire and people have a certain view of Cheshire. It's either the housewives of Cheshire or it's where all the footballers live um, or it's all black and white timbered housing. Um, and Cheshire is like that in many places but where we operate it is like that in some places. But 14 of our neighbourhoods are in the top 10% most deprived wards in the country. And people don't see Cheshire like that. They don't see Cheshire like that at all. That equates to just over two and a half thousand of those 6,000 homes. So I've worked in Liverpool, I think you can tell that from, from the accent of Manchester, and I've worked in some difficult neighbourhoods there. And we've got just as difficult neighbourhoods in, in, uh, in Winsford and in parts of Northwich as well. So we, we, we deal with that real dichotomy of working in an area that's affluent and an area that's full of deprivation. And this little team in the corner that you can't see really is our customers into work team. So one of the lovely things that we do as an organisation, apart from collecting rents, carrying out repairs and allocating properties, which is our core business, is actually help our customers get into work. Because what you've got in Cheshire, and just indulge me for a second, coming from Liverpool, is if you're living in a fairly deprived neighbourhood, you've probably got a neighbourhood next door that's not slightly, you know, slightly better. And the next door to that, slightly better again. So wherever you live, if you've got some ambition, you can actually see a place where you can aspire to. When you work in areas like Cheshire, and Cheshire's not unique, there's lots of places like this around the country, it's either dead posh or where you live. And your aspirations are really limited because how the hell can I afford that half a million quid house over the road? And one of the wonderful things that we do through the Customers Into Work team is to actually give people that aspiration and try and get them into work. So that's just a little plug that if you're ever wondering about a lovely project to do at some time, that's a really nice one to get involved in. So UIC are great really because everything's in the manual. So when they asked me to do, I got notes from Lucy going, here's what we want you to say. <laughs> so it's just like the manual. <laughs> so if ever you're invited to talk here, you know, this is what we want to say. So I was asked, why did you join? Why did you stay? Tell us the highlights. <laughs> Tell us something else. What next and some tips. And you've seen some of these through some of the others as well, haven't you? So all of this is well, well rehearsed in advance apart from the actual content. Um, and it's funny, we all seem to use this word journey, don't we? In terms of organisations and where we go. So I'm naturally going to do as I'm told, as I always do, because that's the best thing with UIC. You should always listen to what they say. You were talking about facilitators earlier. We came up with a cracking idea uh, many moons ago about what we should do is employ a full-time facilitator, because that's the best way of justifying the expenditure. And I've, I've lost count of the amount of times I've got told by Richard and others, it's a big mistake. No, it's not. It's going to work. Well, 12 months later, we were, Richard, it was a big mistake. <laughs> So, um, there we go. Right, so why did I join Weaver Vale? Um, it was my first job as a chief exec, so for me it was a promotion. Um, I'd been passed over twice in the organisation I worked for previously as a promotion, so there was this fire inside of me saying, I'm going to prove you wrong. Uh, how dare you? Oh, yeah, how dare you pass over me for a promotion? For God's sake, what are you doing? Um, it's probably the best decision you ever made because I, I wouldn't have ended up being chief exec of that organisation. And I've really loved my time at, at Weaver Vale. The other thing was, it was a brand new organisation, so it was an LSVT for those who don't work in housing. 
that stands for large scale voluntary transfer. So it was a program a number of years ago where effectively council housing was passed to new organisations called LSBTs, which basically could raise money to carry out repairs that local authorities couldn't do. Uh, and the idea of joining a new organisation as a new chief exec for somebody who was relatively young at the time and ambitious was just right up my street. It was fantastic. Um, it was medium sized. I'd always worked for really large organisations, really large housing associations. So the idea of joining a medium sized one was something that attracted me because if you turn the handle, you'd actually had the chance of seeing an impact of what happened at the end of that. Whereas I think in a larger organisation, it's just a bit more difficult to see the impact of your decisions. And that wasn't for me. It's great for some people, but it, it wasn't for me. And I was also a very ambitious young man. So I thought, right, I'll give this five years and I'm gonna move on um, to do something else. Well, this is my 14th year, year veil, <laughs> Weaver Vale. Vale. So it tells you something about the organisation. It tells you something about the, the flush of youth and how, how quickly you think you can turn things around or, or, or make a difference. Uh, and the older they get, the more wiser you get in terms of some things actually take some time. So why stay? The, the, the first thing um, was, and the reason why the picture of the alligator is up there, and I love this expression, you might have heard it before, is uh, it's really difficult, really difficult to remember that your initial intention was to drain the swamp when you're up to your backside in alligators. And that's what it felt like at Weaver Vale when we first joined, because it was a basket case. Um, the interview had 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 painted this picture of a really good organisation that had a really robust business plan. The business plan wasn't worth the money, it wasn't worth the paper that it was written on. Um, the board were totally dysfunctional, um, and inside a couple of years we totally restructured the, uh, the, the, uh, the executive management team. Craig, I don't know if you were there at the at the start of that, but you know, I think you'll say, because I'll pay you if you don't, um, that the organisation is totally unrecognisable to where it was the, at, at that point. And we were that bad, we got placed into supervision by our regulator. So for those not in house, and that's like a school being placed into, into special measures. Um, so it was really tough. So I had to stay, um, because you know, I was employed as chief exec and I needed to, to, to sort this problem out. I probably learned fair, I probably learned more in those first three years than what I learned from probably the following ten, just actually dealing with that. But I wouldn't recommend it as a learning and development opportunity for anyone. You know, I'd, I would much rather have taken the time to learn that to, to, to actually rather than go through that particular pain at the time. The other thing what you have to do as a LSVT is basically the tenants vote for a transfer on the back of a number of promises. So the thing that we also had to do, and why I had to stay as well, as much as a personal pride, is you know this deal had been sold to basically over 6,000 households on the basis of a series of promises, uh, and we just had to deliver that. So that was another reason why I, I had to stay. Um, and one of the early day things, and this isn't a criticism of local authorities, because local authorities do a really good job for what they do, but you have a different culture inside the local authority that needs to be different when you're an operational organisation that's got a business plan that has to understand the money as pounds, shillings and pence and actually has to deliver with no political interference. So I'm not saying local authority culture is <coughs> bad and housing associations are good, they're just different and you need to bring around that, that cultural change. I think one of the lessons I learned early on was that's probably the hardest thing to do in terms of bringing around culture change inside of an organisation. Interestingly, it's hard if you want to change a good culture, we were talking about this before, it's hard to change a good culture into a bad culture, as much as it is to change a bad culture into a good culture. So some of what I want to talk about later is, is how the things that you can embed inside an organisation can outlast, outlast you as an individual. Because all of us are only temporary custodians of whatever we do, regardless of whether you're a chief exec or a director or a facilitator, we're only ever temporary custodians. And the strength of an organisation is to do with us as individuals and personalities, but the strength of an organisation is its culture, its processes, and the way that things are done around it, down around here. So I was really into trying to bring around this culture change. I'd worked for a fairly, couple of fairly big organisations that somehow it didn't feel right to me in terms of getting right down into the neighbourhoods and having a passion for the neighbourhoods. And I was really, really passionate about trying to get a culture that understood 
that what we were about at the end of the day wasn't just houses, we about the people that lived inside those houses and their lives and how we could actually change their lives. So I was hooked. And what hooked me, as it says there, was the, the neighborhood focus. And the type of culture that we wanted to aspire to, and it's something, and this picture at the bottom is, is it's well known inside the trust, this picture is this little fella. Because we think this epitomizes our culture now. It's a culture which is, yeah, you know what I mean? But it's not showing off. It's not going out there shouting above the rooftops on what good work we're doing. It's just an internal confidence that we've got and a sense of pride when we do something well. But we just share that amongst ourselves and we don't have a big PR around it. And our reputation is big inside and fairly little on the outside, really. And that's a good culture to have, really. It's, it's self-fulfilling in many ways. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of the highlights, um, what's been good throughout those, th those years since those bad early days? Um, actually, coming out of supervision was a highlight. It was a real celebration inside the organisation. The organisation was much stronger following that than what it was beforehand. And it's a bit like a broken leg. A do doctor told me once is that if you break your leg, where your bone's broken, when it sets, that actually becomes the strongest bone in your body because it's set. And being in supervision is a bit like that, is, you know, financially we were all over the place and our governance was really bad. Guess which are two, two of the strongest elements inside the organisation are the financial stewardship and actually the governance of the, of the trust. They've never been stronger and that's built on the fact that you would never ever want to go back to, to that position. Getting to the Sunday Times Top 100 for the first time eight years ago was just an incredible experience. Um, it was incredible for, for a number of things. One, because it was one of those things that just seemed to emerge from somewhere. And somebody said, why don't we put, go in for the Sunday Times Top 100? And the basic response, Craig, was, you're joking, aren't you? You know what I mean? You've got to be joking. There is no way that we will get into, onto that list. Uh, and we came 52, first time round. And we were as shocked as, as anyone actually getting on the list, and actually shocked that we got halfway because a lot of the things that we do inside the trust is a bit like UIC, it's just common sense and it's just treating people with respect, treating them as individuals who've got talent, got creativity and actually harnessing that. We'll talk a bit further in a minute about how UIC has enabled us to actually harness that in a process way that means that it'll last for hopefully a, a long time. We should never forget as landlords, no matter whether we're developing association are you building lots of properties or whether we have a niche market or whatever at the end of the day we're landlords we're social landlords uh, but we're landlords and therefore how satisfied our customers are living in our property should be really really important to us uh, and we've managed to maintain over 90 percent customer satisfaction for at least the last five years and that doesn't happen by accident and it doesn't happen just because we want it to happen or say it has happened. It happens because of the processes that we put in place and the, the annual planning that we put in place, which is all predicated on, on the UIC. The other thing which I think is a real highlight is um, early days of the trust, we used to just have apprentices in our trades, you know, joiners, plumbers and, and what have you. Uh, and over the years, we've actually developed that into an apprenticeship offer right across the whole of the trust. So, you know, just with the trades in the office and and what have you. Um, and at this point in time, 300 staff, probably about 10% are apprentices. I think that's a significant number. We invest heavily in apprenticeships. We've got a lot of apprentices who've actually been through that, have re remained in the trust, managed to secure permanent employment in the trust. What we used to do early days was um, we have an agreement with the unions that every single apprentice we would actually keep in the trust. So our numbers were only quite small because, you know, the turnover rate that you have predicated that. Uh, and we had a conversation and we expected real resistance from the unions in terms of saying, look, we think we need to just expand the offer. And if people have had a really good time in the trust, we've been able to develop them and they go on and move somewhere else, fantastic. Hasn't it just been lovely to be involved in that? And it was actually embraced with open arms. It was one of those ideas that you think you're going to get resistance for and people just bought into it. And it's one of the things that I think is a, is a personal highlight. I started off as a trainee. Um, in Liverpool City Council, so it was something personally important to me because um, I was crap at school, really was. You know, sorry, videoing this as well. Better bleep that out. Um, Change it to shit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
And, and I remember when I started work uh, in the council, I was on like a traineeship uh, program, and we spent two months in six different offices. And it was the first time in my life that I'd found someone who was actually listening to me and taking note of what I said. And academic education in schools just didn't seem to do that. Not in my time, whether it's changed these days, I don't know. Uh, and I just saw the continuation of that of apprenticeships, that what we wanted to do was not just advertise apprenticeships across the board, but we've also targeted picking people up from our neighbourhoods as well, so in terms of customers into work, so it's a virtuous circle, not only are we giving people an opportunity, but there are customers as well. And that leads into the customers into work project, which you've talked about, so I, I won't repeat myself there. And then the final thing is something which I've called the project, and this has been like a, a personal project of, of mine. I've, I've seen my role through all the time in the trust, not all the time, early days was about sorting ourselves out, but once that was sorted out, was, was to say, okay, I want to try and put in place things that make sure the organisation is just sustainable, and don't mean sustainable from a green point of view, but just, just sustainable from an organisational point of view. So what I mean by the project was we talk about this thing, cornerstones inside the trust. So it was about establishing these cornerstones that are always there, and the first thing is about really being clear about what your vision is. I think somebody had said today, just be really clear about what, what your purpose is. Ours is transforming neighbourhoods, homes and services to improve the quality of life of, your, of our customers. The important part of that is improving the quality of life of our customers. That's what we're about. How we do it is through transforming neighbourhoods, homes and services, but that's what we're about as an organisation. That's been there for well over 10 years. It doesn't, st it, it doesn't um, alter. It's a perfect vision because it's always out of reach. You know, we'll never get to the position where we improve the quality of life for all of our customers. So there's always an ambition there that we're trying to strive to um, each year. The other thing is about having a clear set of values because that really determines the way that we not just behave with each other inside the organization, but the way that we actually behave with our customers and stakeholders. So really important to have a vision, what you want to do, where you're going, and a set of values how you actually behave when you're orchestrating that. Now, for me, they're the two, two most important things. So the two most important cornerstones, maybe the ones which are at the foundation, yeah? But to make sure the building's secure, you've got a cornerstones at, at each corner. And one of them is you improve. So it's understanding, as I said before, 90% customer satisfaction doesn't happen by accident. It happens through actually having really good processes People understanding why they're doing what they're doing, and that comes out of annual planning, and actually understanding how we can improve things or alter things through a good project management methodology. So you improve works for us, uh, and it's one of our cornerstones. Uh, and I don't know if we've got it later on, but um, somebody was mentioned to me earlier when we were advertising for my successor, we actually put that in the advert. Uh, we put it in a much more eloquent way than what I'm going to say, but what we basically said is if you want to come to trust and change the way that we deal with annual planning, don't bother, because actually we think we've got a good plan and methodology. But there's something called Crete, which I'll talk about in a minute, where you can make a difference, uh, and that's where the excitement comes. We also have a thing called Colorworks, because as you will all know, is you improve is very process driven, yeah? It's got a manual, you do it this way, or it's the highway, you've got to make sure that you follow this, otherwise it doesn't work. But at the end of the day, all those processes are run by us, human beings. And as human beings, we're, we're fallible, aren't we? You know, we don't always get on with each other. And I don't set out to get on your wish. And you don't set out to get on my nerves. It's just, sorry, this is just, it's not a proper time. It's, I'm just using it for illustrative purposes. <laughs> but that's what happens. And what colour works is, it, it's, it's a behavioural insight tool. And it's something that we use to see how teams operate. We can use it as part of our recruitment process. Um, and it's a narrative that you can have with people in your team that takes the emotion out of it and just say, I'm just wired this way and see the world this way. You're just wired that way. And we just see things differently. And we just need to learn to, to get on. So that's one of our cornerstones. The other is, for an organisation of our size, we only have five levels. Uh, and I'm not saying this is perfect for every organisation. But there's five levels, so there's me, there's our directors, there's our senior managers, which we call enterprise group managers, our team leaders, and frontline staff. We don't have any deputies, we don't have any assistants, we have no one in between, so we have a fairly flat structure. It brings some difficulties with it because there's less promotional opportunities because there aren't as many rungs in the ladder. But the advantages are, 
Uh, it doesn't take long for something happening on the front line to get to a manager in terms of understanding. And it doesn't take long for if I've got certain messages that I need to give out for it to get to the, the bottom line. And it really helps in that communication process of both up and down. And the main thing that it does, and we did have deputies and assistants when the trust first started, it really drives up accountability because when I was asking questions when I first started, who's responsible for this? There was more than one finger being pointed different ways. So it was like, well, the assistant, or is it the manager, or, or what have you. So we have five levels. So for the trust, there are four cornerstones that exist there that will never change unless the organisation grows profusely, uh, in which case we might have to look at the five levels. But definitely vision and values, you improve and colour works will always be there as cornerstones inside the trust. What that enables us to do is because we've got those, those cornerstones, they create, as what I've talked there, is certainty. They create certainty of process, certain, certainty of direction of travel, certainty in terms of the expectations that I have of the way that people will behave with each other and the way that um, managers will behave with the staff and staff will behave with managers as well. So it's a two-way street, it's not just down, um, it's up and down as well. And what that enables you to do when you've got that certainty is you can change and adapt. Because change is scary. Change is really, really scary. But if people know that there's a process that you go through and you arrive at the end and you've done this two or three times, and because we've done you improve, you improve for well over 10 years now, we've got a track record internally where we can say to people, like Craig, we've been through six big changes together and you're still here. You know what I mean? So, you know, like, there is a, because everyone's worry from change comes, how's it going to affect me, isn't it? That, that's where your first worry comes from. So if you've got some certainty around the way that you do things, it enables you to be brave in terms of the changes that you need to do. And we just talk about Darwin. You, you, you must have heard that, that thing from Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but those which are most adaptable to change. And that's a bit like a clarion call. You get bored with me saying that all the while, don't you? But it's a bit of a clarion call we have inside the organisation. And because that, that in itself creates certainty. It's like a paradigm, really. There's going to be change, but we know it's, there's a certainty around that because the organisation will continue to be successful because, you know, your future performance, a good indication of what you're going to happen in the, in, in, in the future is what you've done in the past. So we've got this track record of being able to use you and prove to demonstrate that. And where the excitement comes going forward is, is what we've called Crete. Um, and Claire was talking about a mnemonic before, I think it was Hope, wasn't it, Claire? Yeah, yeah. And we have a um, mnemonic called Crete. And it's memorable because of my accent, Crete. Um, and it's also memorable because it's a lovely destination, isn't it? Who doesn't want to go to Crete? But what it stands for is the C stands for commercial head and social heart. So Claire was talking earlier about the challenges that we've got inside the housing industry and housing association colleagues will, will know what they're about. But, but basically, you know, our rents were, were cut a number of years ago. We're still in the middle of doing that. Um, funding for lovely projects and supporting people and helping, you know, disadvantaged people, that's all gone away, you know, and the demand's never been greater. We've seen increased homelessness. Um, and effectively, we've just got to run our organisations on a more commercial basis. But we should never forget our social hearts why we're here. You know, so that's that's as much about just a, a little bit of a, a change in the culture, but being really clear that it's commercial head and social hearts. The R stands for rewarding our best customers. So what we've started to think about is what we need to do going forward is understand how many of those customers actually make demands on our services. And by demands, I don't just mean repairs, I mean, you know, causes antisocial behaviour or don't pay the rent or what have you. Um, and those customers who don't. And effectively, those customers who don't, we're just like a bank, you know what I mean? They're not drawing their money out of the organisation, so therefore we can survive. If everybody was making demands on our services at the same time, the trust was imp would implode. So we've said, right, we need to get to a position, because for years, lots of our customers were saying, the only time we ever hear from you is when you tell us what the rent increase is every year, um, but I know when you're dealing with, you're around Mary's house every week, and she's causing problems, and she's got three housing officers coming around, and, and we moved to a position where we said, okay, well, we need to start rewarding our best customers. So we do a monthly draw. You know, if you want to find out how it works, come and see me during the break. But what we've also able to do 
Because we actually identify who our best customers are, what we say to those who don't join in, so don't you know, conform to the terms of the attendance agreement, actually, <coughs> it's not just you gain advantage, you go to the back of the queue for other things. So when we come to carry out our kitchen programs replacement, or are putting our new central heating in, you're at the back of the queue until you've paid your rent. And the queue's that big, actually, we'll probably never get round to doing it until you pay your rent. So that's a bit of a commercial approach, but it's still with a social heart, but it's about understanding that we do need to reward our best customers. The first D is exploiting new or new, or new or not to new technology. Um, Richard said, I'm really proud about the trust. I really am, but I also recognise its weaknesses. And where we're probably further behind the game is an exploiting new or new, new or not to new technology. Um, we've got a big change project going on in property services now, which is absolutely that. It's using mobile technology. It's basically getting to the position that most of us experience when we're dealing with our bank. You know what I mean? Most of us will have that experience, and most of our customers have that experience as well. So it's about understanding that you know that's where we need to go, and that's creating excitement inside the organisation. The T stands for transformation. It's part of what we do. It should be. It should uh, continue to be part of what we do. And our stock is getting to the age now where some of our neighbor neighbourhoods need more of a transformational approach than just replacing the kitchens and bathrooms again in five years' time. And finally, as was mentioned earlier, is about embracing social media. It's the only time in my tenure at the Trust where I've asked people to do things that I don't do. So I'm not on Facebook, I don't do Twitter, it bores me senseless. Um, but I absolutely understand that there's not just a generation coming through, there's a generation already there that communicates in that way uh, and, and we'll miss a trick if we don't embrace social media, either in the way we communicate with colleagues inside the organisation or we communicate with our customers. So for me, that's been the project really, to try and make sure that those things are embedded inside the organisation. So whoever's in my job is the organisation has got a clear pathway to its future. So what's next for me? <laughs> Corfu and Macrit. So I finish work on Friday the 16th of June and then I'm having a big fat Greek retirement party <laughs> in Corfu with 30 friends and family. I don't know, there's no interest of you to whatsoever, but you did ask me what's coming yeah. next and that's what's coming next. So it's Corfu and Macrit and that's the view of the apartments. It was fantastic. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, for me personally, not a chief exec. I've really loved being a chief exec, but uh, and I now want to move from a position where um, I'm currently mostly working and really enjoying myself on small occasions to the position where I'm mostly enjoying myself on most of the occasions and occasionally working. Um, so I'm a non-exec director on another housing association. I'm a non-exec director on a care company. I'd love to be a non-exec director in another company somewhere. I really love doing that because it, it's a cracking job. I love being a chief exec. At a board meeting, you'd have that cracking debate, but then you'd have to take the work away. Being a board member is fantastic. You'd have the debate, <laughs> you don't take the work away. You just go, can you do that? And come at the next meeting, it's fantastic. Uh, and I'm open to offers. So if you think I can help your organization in any way, I'd be more than happy to do that. If I can help your IC in any way, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. So my reflection, hopefully, based on that, on whether I'm going to have a smiley face going forward or a, concern, a concerned face going forward, I'll tell you at the end because I forgot I've got some tips. So for individuals, the, the one thing I've learned is, is you really need to be true to yourself. Um, there was a period in my life when I was a manager where I was conscious of my accent and I thought I had to tone that down. Um, I thought I had to act the way that my boss acted rather than the way that I acted myself. And then um, I came across one manager who turned around to me and basically gave me that advice and said, just be true to yourself and be yourself. And from then on, it, it's funny how just doors seem to open and they just seem to get on better. So that's the first one. Tell it how it is. Um, you can speak to Meg, Holly and Craig and ask them whether I'm honest and whether I just tell people inside the organisation how it is. You know, whether we're doing good or we're doing bad, or whether I think this in, whether this individual is doing good or bad. If they ask me opinion, I'll tell them exactly how it is. Um, and the final thing is just surround yourself with good people. Is 
is don't think you've always got the answer yourself because you haven't. Some, some areas you will, you'll be an expert in your area, but surround, you, surround yourself with good people and it just makes your job a hell of a lot easier. So there are my tips for individuals, tips for organisations. So if you're in a leadership um, role here, the only tips I'd, I'd share with yourself, if I could be so bold, is do have that clarity of purpose. You know, that's really important. Do understand what your values are and live them yourself. So don't have a set of values just on the wall that just sits there, um, but actually live them and demonstrate them and have opportunities during appraisals or one-to-ones or just conversations to show how either you've demonstrated them or the individual that you're talking to just recognise that they've demonstrated openness or respect or enthusiasm. And the final thing is SPCLRC, and that's not, that's not a Roman centurion Legion name. It stands for Structure, Process, Competency, Leadership, Resources and Communication. I'll just quickly chop through what I mean by that. So everything else that I've talked about, the other framework that goes on in my head constantly, and it's not a cornerstone, it's just a, a personal methodology, is what UIC will do for you is sort your processes out. Yeah? But those alone won't deliver everything that you need. So you need to understand what structure you need in place. And I know some of this will just be dead common sense for, for people here, but you did ask me for some tips. So the, the, <laughs> When, where some organisations start is they start with the structure first, you know what I mean? It's going wrong, so we need three of these instead of two of them, or we need two bosses where we add one and what have you. So your process is out first, and then the structure will actually, you know, um, will reveal itself. It's a well-known expression, which is like form follows function. But sometimes people stop at them, they go, yeah, we've done really good, yeah. you know, we sorted the process out, we sorted the structure job done. You then need to think about what competency yeah, you need, because if you've changed your structure, Somebody might have been absolutely fantastic at this job one day. If the structure's changed and the nature of the job has changed, it doesn't mean that individual is no longer fantastic. It just means you need a different competency or the same competency. So, you know, my tip would be think about the competency that you need and people's individual's ability to change and move to that competency or whether they've got it or not. You absolutely need leadership. You hear a lot about that when you come on. Uh, anything to do with you improve. And it's not just leadership at the top. If you're in a, in a managerial position, be it a team leader, a manager, senior manager, director, you are a leader, and it's understanding that, and it's promoting that message inside your organisation. If there was one thing, there was one magic ingredient that makes a good organisation a great, great organisation, it's having as many people in those positions understanding that they are leaders, not just the senior team. And as with everything, you need resources, and that's just not financial resources to deliver everything, because you know money makes the world go round. But it's also what intellectual resources you've got inside the organisation. Who are your thinkers? You know, because somebody was talking about before, people are really good at process, other people are good at conceptual thinking or creativity, and it's about understanding what IT resources you've got and your human resources. So it's not just about money. And the final thing is is communication is just so important. There's no organisation in this world that's got communication boxed off because it's a constantly moving feast, but just understanding the communication both up and down is really important. You can do all of this, you can have the fan most fantastic set of strategies and processes, but if you have not communicated that throughout the organisation, it's just existing in a bubble. And guess what? If it just exists in a bubble, it goes nowhere. So, there are my tips, and hopefully, Thanks for listening. It is a smiley face, and I'm off. <laughs>